Okay, and yep, of course it goes back to the first slide. And that's not going to help me any. Arr. There we go. And now this button will take us to the uh, appropriate slide. All right, so part three, the final wrap-up uh, section. Uh, let's talk about ending prejudice and discrimination. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, this is from the American Red Cross. Well, I want my pen. The Red Cross. Notice anything about this? Uh, let's see, most of the black kids are not cool. But who's cool? The white kids are cool. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have to really uh, be very careful about what decisions you make without consciously uh, making those decisions. I think that's the one thing all the research on implicit racism uh, is teaching us. And I'll get to that more specifically in a minute. Uh, but let's talk about ending racism, which is what all this is about. Uh, the textbook and a lot of people will say that the best thing that social psychology has is the jigsaw classroom. Here's the website. You know, this technique is so, you know, famous that it has its own website. However, there's a little secret to this. This is this article you see here is from 1985. Uh, so even back in 18, 1890, 1985, we know that the jigsaw classroom failed to have a positive effect on outcome variables. And this is consistent with earlier research. That is, we've always known that the jigsaw classroom doesn't work that well. Uh, and in two weeks, I'll talk, we'll come back to that and I'll talk about exactly why. Uh, but, you know, uh, just suffice to say, it's not as much of a godsend or a cure-all that we think it is. It's, it works, but it's very, very, very difficult to make it work. So what do I recommend in its place? Uh, we've already talked about the psychological method that I would recommend, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is a very powerful effect, a very powerful phenomena. And it can do a, cause a lot of changes in people, and uh, from in many different uh, situations, and race is one of them. Uh, so let me introduce this by telling you a story. Uh, back when I was in high school, and I was in high school uh, 1976 to 1980 in Ohio, and in the cafeteria, oh gosh, I hate thinking about this, uh, you know, during lunchtime, uh, they would uh, have WRAM, our mascot was the Ram, Rousey the Ram, and they'd have WRAM radio over the, the you know, PA, uh, where, uh, you know, different students would uh, spin tunes. And uh, given the composite racial nature of our school, uh, one day a week was given to a black DJ. And, uh, you know, I loved it because, uh, you know, that one day a week we weren't hearing like sticks, uh, but we were hearing early rap, which was really amazing. Jam, 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 oh. And uh, loved it, but a lot of my white friends hated it. In fact, a lot of them would refer to it as the end music and end music day. And one friend of mine uh, would come into the uh, cafeteria, oh, it's end music day, shit. And uh, so, again, 1980, Ohio. But so what, you know, that person probably, you know, was a racist and still is a racist, right? Not really. Uh, I'm a horrible friend to have on Facebook because that person I was just telling you about these are some posts from her Facebook, which I stole <laughs> and didn't tell her about. And so this is a, uh, a person who was pretty racist back in high school. And that was not the only time she used the N-word. And then, uh, you know, I friended her or she friended me. I for, really forget which. And then I noticed, you know, and I, you know, I wasn't really that good friends with her. But then I noticed that these posts started to come up. 
and all of these posts are very very anti-racist and I was like what the heck's going on how did this person change from being really racist to really uh, anti-racist not just you know cool but anti-racist and then looking around on her Facebook I discovered that her son her only son uh, married a, a black woman and so therefore her only grandchildren are uh, black or mixed race and so think about this from a cognitive dissonance perspective that is you're a racist but then your son does something stupid and marries a, a black person now grandchildren that you've been waiting for forever to dote on the only black the only grandchildren you're going to have are mixed race so do you stick to your beliefs about race and you know uh you know uh, uh you reject your uh, only grandchildren and don't see them or do you go see your grandchildren and then you start to suffer from cognitive dissonance i love my mixed race grandchildren but i don't like black people and cognitive dissonance starts to work and you don't want to give up those grandchildren so you start changing your attitude about black people and you change it farther and farther so not only do you not hate black people but you actually are against racism and so this is just one example and I see a lot of it happening uh, with people in my generation where your grandchildren are mixed race and people who've been racist their entire lives change all of a sudden also uh, if you're a homeowner uh, you know home you know when you buy a house you're making a huge investment and in many ways it's a long-term investment and so what happens when a black family buys a house next door you know and again that's one of the things that causes the dissidence uh, where you have to work with the black family next door and you kind of like them you know propinquity you see them often and probably since they're living in the same neighborhood they have the same income and so you kind of like them and so now what do you do about your major racist beliefs well you start to change them slowly uh, because you kind of have to and that's cognitive dissonance uh, the same thing happened with Daryl Davis Remember, I showed you that video, never really talked about it. Now I'm talking about it. Uh, and really, this is the type of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, way of, you know, reducing racism that I believe in personally and professionally the most. Uh, but I will talk about some others. And another one is talking about implicit prejudice. What do we do about people with implicit implicit prejudice uh, I've shown you this uh, table before and if we fill it in I don't know why I had this one with the blanks but if we fill it in uh, you know we you know I've talked about this last week uh, we have the old-fashioned racist here uh, but here we have the unique problem of somebody who implicitly is racist but consciously they they really aren't aware of it uh, and what can we do about them? Uh, Patricia Devine, uh, you know, back in 1989 devised an experiment that really identified what to do about them. Uh, she looked at people who had, uh, you know, low conscious levels of racism but high implicit levels of racism. And uh, she would do any type of cognitive test, decision making test, like the IAT or uh, Ben Zeeb or uh, you know Hugenberg and Bodenhausen and then she'd say oh you know uh, we did this test on you and uh, by the way we know you were answering as if you were racist because even though we know that you believe that you're not racist unconsciously you are racist and when they explain that to people and then they have them do the experiment again what happens is they start expanding cognitive effort uh, because if you are low C 
racist, that is, if you are uh, consciously not a racist, you are disgusted by the fact that unconsciously you are a racist. And so in situations where that may affect you, you start to slow down and you start to expand cognitive effort uh, to slow down your processing and think carefully about what's going on. And so in the experiments the second time around, uh, people would slow down uh, when they were exposed to making decisions about black people and they would slow down and start to very, very explicitly make decisions uh, about what, you know, about judgments about the black people that they were judging. And so what they do is they would, going back to like the first week's lecture, conscious control. They would expand a great deal of conscious, conscious effort. They would say to themselves, this is something that I cannot, uh, you know, uh, let my unconscious processes deal with. I have to consciously deal with it myself. You stop paying attention to everything else. You slow your thinking down and you step carefully step by step think through the steps of making judgments about this person to make sure that you're not going to be racist. And again, uh, figuring out a way to get people, white people to realize that they may be unconsciously racist is difficult, but once that d happens, the cognitive dissonance kicks in and it forces you to take cognitive control over decisions associated with black people or decisions in which your implicit racism could come out. Uh, so that is another uh, you know, popular and I think uh, effective way of uh, dealing with the low C, high I uh, prejudice pre people. And then I talked about, uh, you know, the systems and how racism is, is systemic. And uh, so I should at least talk about one aspect of changing the systems uh, to deal with racism, and that's, uh, I think, school desegregation. Uh, and uh, Walter Steffen, back in like the 90s or 2000s, no, 90s, uh, in uh, his book, Opening Doors, summarized the short and the long-term effects of de school desegregation. I'm talking about primary and secondary. And, uh, you know, here are the short-term effects, improves black uh, achievement on tests, uh, you know, the best design studies, find small improvements in reading, uh, for black uh, students. Uh, however, that small uh, you know, improvement would eradicate reading score gaps in seven years. Uh, decreases black students' prejudice towards whites. Uh, increases white students' prejudice towards bl blacks. Uh, white parents' attitudes towards discrimination become more positive, however. And even though you see an increase in white students' uh, prejudice, there is no effect on interracial aggression. It doesn't cause more, uh, you know, interracial aggression in the schools. What about the long term? Well, let's focus on blacks who attend desegregated high schools. They're more likely to finish high school, attend college, have higher college GPAs, attend traditionally white colleges, major in science and technology, have higher occupational statuses, earn more on the job, work in an integrated environment as adults, as work with white people as adults. They receive more favorable evaluations from their white coworkers and bosses, and they form more cross-racial friendships as adults. Uh, remember when I was talking about the economic and the wealth and the employment uh, systemic differences between black and white people. These long-term gains of having school desegregation would address all of those systemic differences. And so what's really important is desegregation, desegregating schools and desegregating high schools. How have we been doing on that? Oh, not that well. Uh, 2012, uh, you know, 
double deepening double segregation for more students that is segregation in schools is becoming worse and from this uh, 2012 the Obama administration like the Bush administration has taken no significant action to increase school integration or to stabilize diverse schools as uh, racial changes occur in urban and uh, suburban housing, housing markets. Small positive steps in civil rights enforcement have been undermined by the Obama administration's strong pressure for char uh, charter schools. That is, no politician likes to touch the idea of desegregating schools. And so what that means is that schools are resegregating. And so uh, the complete reverse is happening. So in terms of addressing the systemic issues, in terms of the educational systems and the money and the economic and the wealth systems, uh, a major way of actually physically addressing that would be to integrate schools more. And unfortunately, nobody really likes to be doing that politically. All right, so that's it for today's lecture. Uh, I will see you in our synchronous lecture. Uh, take care. Oh, and one more slide. By the way, New York has the most segregated schools in the nation. Sorry, folks. <laughs>